with the cloud. Okay, wonderful. So this time I have actually, I've made some notes, um, just because I don't know if any of you went to Yulia's presentation. Did any of you go? Ah, it was fantastic, well, wasn't it? But I just thought, oh God, how can I follow that? She's so, she, she, she but she, I have to realize we have slightly different styles. So she's very um, coherent and um, ordered in a particular structure in a particular way. So anyway, um, welcome, welcome. So I've called this late prayer and I've called it late prayer after a poem that I've heard Steve read many, many times. Yeah, so it's a bit unstable. So um, just give me a wave if I'm going in and out. Yeah, I'm assuming that you can still hear me. Okay, great. So I'll just, I'll start and I'll end with this prayer, I think. Um, just to say, all of the poems that I'm gonna share in today's session are written by Buddhists. Um, yeah, so I, I did that deliberately. Um, so Late Prayer is by somebody called Jane Hirschfield, and it goes like this. Tenderness does not choose its own uses. It goes out to everything equally, circling rabbit and hawk. Look, in the iron bucket, a single nail, a single ruby, all the heavens and hells, they rattle in the heart and make one sound. Yeah. Um, so, um, um, there's, there's something about that poem which speaks to me about this, uh, this um, resonant field that's often spoken about in uh, generative coaching, uh, which is equally welcoming to all experience. Um, and in this session, I decided that I wanted to uh, uh, center what I shared with you around gladdening the heart and also around finding very tangible ways to access the coach state. Um, and, and I, someone was saying to me the other day, why do you call it a coach state and why instead of calling it a flow state, because it's pretty much the same thing. And, and what I said to them is, well, what I really love about the coach and acronym is, is that it points to tangible ways in which you might be able to access the state. Whereas if I just say to myself, oh, I must get into the flow zone. It's sort of a bit abstract. I'm like, where do I go with that? Whereas with the coach and acronym, it's a bit more points you in a, in a kind of direction. So I don't know, I know that you've all been around, so I don't know if it's worth me just sharing what coach stands for um, in this space. Do, would that be helpful if I just say it again here? Yeah, I'll say it, okay. I've got to remember now. <laughs> but um, so the first C stands for centering, yeah. and. Um, what I do sometimes when I when I do that, I just sort of make this movement down because for me, I really learned that I need to get lower in my body for my center. Um, so that means uh, down underneath my belly button, somewhere around there. And then O uh, stands for open. Yeah. So so there's something about being um, close to your center and open to the field, as it were, something like that. And I know that from um, working, uh, doing Taekwondo uh, practice, if you're, if you're centered but not open to the field, a bit like this, you're gonna get kicked probably. <laughs> and if you're open to the field but not centered, you're also gonna lose your balance. So I sort of really see those two as come being part of the same thing in a way, dropping into center, opening to the field. And then the A stands for awareness, so coming into some kind of present experience. The second C stands for connection, and oftentimes that's connecting to our resources. And then the H stands for, it can, it can stand for hospitality, holding, and there's a third H, 
what does anyone know what it's because i can't remember what was honoring honoring yeah beautiful that's really be very regal isn't it somehow Ga gal gallant is that the word gallant um honoring this honoring of experience yeah and then um so we're going to do some different uh i'm practices and offerings and then we're going to culminate at the end uh, with something that I call the body of knowing or the felt it the felt sense practice and and actually it's really simple but I find it to be incredibly effective and and in some ways that practice is very linked to what what we need to access when we're practicing focusing Eugene Gendelin's method but also I've come across it through my Buddhist training and, and, and it's very resonant with the generative work too. Yeah, and then, and then the other thing that I just wanted to say is that usually we, ha we have a relationship with the idea of a lived experience rather than the lived experience itself. So I'm just going to say that one more time. So usually we have a relationship with the idea of a lived experience rather than the lived experience itself. So I'm really hoping in this workshop that I and you will um, find a way to drop more fully into a lived experience as opposed to the idea of it. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, I think I just share a little tiny bit about me, which is that I'm drawing heavily on my Buddhist practice. So I was ordained as a Buddhist six years ago after training for 16 years. And although I'm not like a um, staunch Buddhist in a certain kind of way, um, certainly I am flavoured by Buddhism. I think I, it would be true to say. Um, so I'm drawing on that, I'm drawing on the focusing method and the generative work, but also I just absolutely love poetry. And what I love about poetry is that, um, oh, I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> you might have heard this story. This is a story about the poet Ruth Stone. I don't know if you've heard this story, but Elizabeth Kilbert tells this story and she says that Ruth Stone lived somewhere in America, out in, in a rural landscape. And, and she would say that she'd be outside on the land and she would hear a poem like rumbling across the landscape towards her. And, uh, and she would run back to her house to get a piece of paper and pen to write it down before it passed her by. And in the story, she says that she can hear it like a train rumbling across the landscape and she's outside and she hasn't got pen and paper and she's running back. And as she runs home, it's just gone by and she kind of catches it by the tail and pulls it back to her. And she writes down this poem word perfectly from the end word to the first word as she catches it by the tail. So there's something in that that speaks to me about what poetry is, the life, the life of the being that is somehow poetry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, to begin with, uh, well, to begin again, uh, I'm going to share another poem, which is by somebody called David Brazier. And he and his wife are both practicing Buddhists, but also really committed to ecotherapy. Um, so make strong, strongly into um, the environment and um, social concern. And, and what your what your sense from this poem is that um, it's like it's almost like a reverie of evoking interconnection. Yeah. So it's quite long, and feel free to lean back, lie down, get relaxed, because, um, yeah, because of its length. So it's called, Where Were You Last Year? Breathe deep, breathe deep. The air fills my lungs and then my blood receives this grace 
by which I live a few moments more. My every cell replenished. With every breath, a part of me departs and something new is put in place. The rice I ate yesterday, where is it now? In my muscle, in my bone. The juice we shared, where has it gone? In our arms and legs and all. Last month, the rice waved in the sunshine in other lands, in the low floodplains of the Mississippi or Irrawaddy. And the fruit hung on trees in Cyprus, Sicily or Spain. And before that, before that, their substance was in the soil, was in the air, was in the seas was in the seas, waiting to be gathered up, waiting to soar up into the highest reaches of the sky, waiting to become rain. You and I are mostly water. Last year, most of each of us was in the ocean. We circled together in the Atlantic or Pacific perhaps, for we are mostly water. And that water was lifted by sunshine heat, by the impact of photons cascading down, beating on the ocean's face. And every photon comes from the sun, from the belly of the star. You and I were stars last year. We chase each other in the turbulent heat of the sun. So who was it that lived in your house last year? And where will you be next week? And who is your true friend? And who your foe? And who will you be next year? Breathe deep, breathe deep. This air is me, this air is you, this air we share. I give my substance to you and you, yours to me. With each breath, I am linked in a single orbit with the great forests. My outbreath is their food. Theirs fills my lungs. Last year, I was a tree, and the tree was me. Each day, we gather up substance and continue the task of endlessly remaking ourselves from one another. Each day we discard a portion and continue the cycle of endlessly returning ourselves to others. Day by day we change and become one another, the substance of the universe, stardust and all, passing through us each and we through it. Where were you last year? Breathe deep, breathe deep. So I'm, I'm just going to guide us for a really short settling meditation. So um, yeah, find, find a posture if you haven't already got it where you can um, have a sense of finding a way to be wakeful and uh, a way in which your body might be able to relax into his or herself. So we're just going to begin by um, having a sense of the space around yeah, something really uh, ordinary like a sense of your neighbourhood. Yeah, maybe a sense of the shape of the land on which your neighbourhood has been built. Yeah, so in this way, we kind of locate ourselves. So for me, I can sense that the ocean is just over there and then a steep 
mountains are just in the other direction. And I'm at the end of the village. And then let's see if we can find the breath touching the body. Yeah, always available to us, the breath. And I wonder if it's possible just to take a few deeper breaths, maybe um, breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. So inviting a little more life, maybe a little bit more aliveness into the body. And as we breathe, we might be able to just have a sense upwards, just having a sense upwards. Yeah, playfully imagining the sky up there. Yeah. Sense that the sky is somehow more vast than the roof of your abode. So we can playfully move through the roof open to the sky. And then maybe we can have a sense that the curve of the skull is somehow attracted to that broad, deep sky. Almost as if the curve of the scalp might release itself upwards into that space. Maybe sensing the horizon somehow through soft face. Yeah, so in a way, we see if we can do this without trying. And then at the same time, having a sense of really dropping down into our root. Yeah, somewhere down there in the pelvis and the soles of our feet. And maybe we could have a sense of the earth below the foundations of the building, the crust of the earth. And maybe a sense even of the center, the heart of this planet. And maybe we can playfully imagine that our pelvis is somehow attracted by and to and with the center of the earth. So that somehow we're in between these sky and earth, this something below and something above. Relaxing down, releasing up, breathing. Yeah, somewhere in between all of that, there's our tender face, our beating hearts, our guts.
And maybe we could say something nice to ourselves. Something like, I'm here with you, my darling face. Yeah, easy, easy girl, oh, easy. It's a bit as if I were talking to a horse. And we can just see if we can just rest in all of this. Yeah, nothing to try and do. And then we can just gently begin to have a sense of transitioning back into a more extroverted space between us. But we can do that without rushing and um, maybe exploring something of a soft transition. And um, so what I'm going to invite us to do is just in this moment, just see if you can imagine your favorite landscape in the world, a kind of particular kind of landscape and a particular kind of weather. So it could be a forest, a dewy forest in the dawn or could be an autumnal walk in the mountains with a huge horizon. So I'm just going to invite you just to have a sense of a kind of landscape that if you find yourself there, you feel really good, like, oh yeah, this life feels good to me when I'm in this place. That even if you haven't even been there, <laughs> if I'm in this kind of landscape, it feels good to me. And this kind of weather is just the cherry on the top of the cake. And then I'm just going to invite you to, yeah, come back into the room. And uh, we're going to go round and we're going to share the landscape and the weather that just came into our minds just then. And the invitation is that when somebody's sharing the landscape, um, just to see if we can just, um, yeah, almost as if that landscape had a flavour just see if we can really sense the flavor of that weather and landscape in our bodies somehow. So we're not having to try hard, but if I say something like the sound of snow, my sense is that the body, if you've ever been in snow, knows something about the sound of snow. Yeah, you don't have to um, try too hard. So I'll start. <laughs> My landscape has snow <laughs> and um, would be like, um, if you can imagine mountains um, either side of a valley. And, and I really like to be at the bottom of mountains, actually, not the top, because I like the shape of the mountain sort of uh, 
big and steady, like strong shoulders around me. And um, yeah, I really love that. Uh, the, I love the beauty of snow, but also that, that sense of something feeling both spacious and quite close in, in the, that particular kind of sound that snow creates. So that's my landscape. And I'm going to pass on to Claire. My landscape is green grass, very expansive field on a gently sloping hill. And it's the fields and the slope moves up to a horizon that's bright, blue sky, and gentle breeze, the smell of the sea, and I'm aware of my friends with me, and it's gently warm, and very green. I'm aware of the blades of grass, glistening in the sunlight and green, glistening, bright, gentle breeze. Beautiful. Thank you. And I'll pass on to Philip. <clears throat> okay, so my landscape is, uh, it's here. <laughs> and there's something special knowing that it's, this is part of the, what's called the Great Canadian Shield. It's granite. And it's the root of mountains that were formed right at the beginning, basically, <laughs> some of the oldest mountains, and they've worn down. So what we have here now, you rise up, you go walk up through trees, it's uh, oak forests, and you just follow a track up through the oak forest, and come to a, a lake mm. full of uh, uh, the tall uh, trunks of trees, which have been, I don't know, how, they're, they're just the trunks left and there's no <laughs> the branches. It's quite common in Canada. But from this point, which is a lovely point, you rise up, you, you follow around the root of a rock and you just walk around the base of it through the trees and then you just gradually start to climb the granite gently and then there you, you're on top uh, just on top of this granite uh, mat rock big rock <laughs> not just a rock uh, plateau should we say <laughs> but it's like a rock it's separate it doesn't go on for miles it's uh, it's like a rocky hill so there's nice plants that grow on rocks scrubby bushes and there's a view that looks right out across all this woodland and then across the river and over there is America and in the other direction is more greenery <laughs> and somewhere down there is where our house is in among the trees but you can't see it so it's um and it's very sunny. This is, I always go there in the summer. Mm -hmm. So this is a place where one day I'm going to say, run a camera and do some Qigong and share it. <laughs> it's a great place for Qigong. Yeah, so we can come down now, down through the trees and come home. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. Thank you. I'll pass this on to Paul.
Um, my landscape is um, is a real place in Wales called uh, Rosilli Beach. Some of you might know it. It's one of the most beautiful beaches uh, in the UK. And um, I imagine it on a sunny day with lovely blue skies. We don't get an awful lot of those sunny days and blue skies in Wales, so they're rare. So it's, it's extra special, really, I guess, for that reason. And um, when you arrive at Rosilli, you kind of park in the car park, which overlooks the beach. When you arrive in that car park, you're like, you can't wait really to kind of get out of the car and look down over the beach because it's quite a expansive kind of um, uh, beach with beautiful golden sand and you can mm -hmm. see for quite a distance. Um, but to get to the beach, there's a bit of a, a walk down the cliff, which takes about maybe 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that in itself is lovely to do as well. Um, and then when you're on the beach, of course, the sand is lovely and golden. And um, you can hear the, the, the sea lapping away and um, see the sun in the sky. And uh, Natasha, when you spoke earlier, you used the word flavour. And um, thank you for that, because it made me think of caramel. And I'll forever associate caramel with that beach now from <laughs> now on. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. And um, do you want to pass on, Paul? Um, can I pass over to Haya? Thank you, Paul. Um, actually, my landscape is a time when I was a young child. Um, I grew up in Saudi Arabia, and we used to take these long uh, drives with my dad. Uh, the whole family actually, and we drive to the desert. So I don't know if, if you're familiar with the Great Arabian Desert. Um, uh, when you're camping there, and in the three hours in the morning, it's it's completely golden sand and blue skies, and I can hear. I actually heard the wind, the the sound of the wind. Um, it's so serene so quiet and so peaceful and beautiful. And there's actually nothing. You're in the middle of nowhere and you feel whole and quiet. And um, we used to take these trips quite frequently. So when you were talking about the landscape, this is what came to my mind. Mm. Yeah, I really sense a sense of that. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, I'd like to pass it on to Francis. Hmm. Um, so um, my landscape is on being in a small boat. Somebody else has got uh, driving the motor and I've got my hand in the sea. And it's a sunny day. It's very calm, and um, there we pass on the west coast of Ireland. We're passing some islands that we're familiar with, and I suppose the thing that comes to me is is how enormous the ocean is and the Atlantic Ocean is, but also how fragile we are at, at one level. But also there's the theme of we're in a flow here and people have been doing this for hundreds, maybe a thousand years, having the same experience because there's something about the landscape that recognizes you and it's quite sacred in some ways. Yes. That's it. Oh, I'll pass it on to Fiona. Mm. Mm. I am parking my car and today's free parking and I'm walking down and there's this sense of, wow, I'm nearly there. I'm walking down this pathway and then a sort of um, a muddy area that's flat with sea, 
vegetables, see cabbages growing, and then just beyond, I can hear the sea. It's wild. And I'm walking down and the wind is blowing me and I get to the edge of the water and I'm being chased by the waves as they come in and I'm walking along and just feeling the breeze in my, in my face and my body. I know this place, I've known this place for ooh, 40 years, 50 years even. And the cliffs are changing, they're crumbling. So I'm walking along and the sea is on my left and the cliffs are on my right. And the, the sea has been wild and it's taken all the, the shingle away and these rocks, these gray rocks. And it just feels like exhilarating and they just play in the wind. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Yeah, wonderful. So um, I hope that you got a sense of how evocative um, on, on, on different sense levels, uh, imagining landscape can be in the body. And, and, and sometimes I ask myself the question, if I were a landscape now and a kind of weather now, what would I be? just as a means of expressing um, what's going on for me now, but in the form of a landscape. And, and I can find that really helpful, like, oh, there's a storm on the horizon, <laughs> or, or I'm in the middle of a gale or whatever that is. Um, so I can use it as a means of kind of expressing myself in a particular kind of way that feels uh, very natural, actually. It feels very natural. But also I can, I can uh, bring to mind a landscape like we've done here, which can just uh, really resource me in a way where like um, Haya was mentioning something about the quiet in the desert. And I, oh, it just felt like it was um, balm when, when she said that. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to share that. Um, the possibilities around imagining uh, landscapes. I mean, obviously I sp spend quite a lot of time in nature, but there's also um, something around bringing, bringing what, what, what we, how we work with our mind in terms of um, coach states and gladdening the heart. Yeah. Does anyone have anything that they want to share or, or ask? before we move on to the next part. Just, uh, uh, just thank you for that last, um, both those things. Um, the, the, the vocal landscape as a resource, because it's such an easy, easy, it's e well, I find it easy. Not everyone may find it easy. <laughs> easy thing to imagine and you can imagine which resource you want. I can imagine like um, sometimes I've, I've done what you said, but I wasn't really asking for a landscape, just asking for an image. You know, okay, so where am I at now? And it'd be like, oh, I'm in a peaceful lagoon. But although that may sound great, I actually need to get out of that lagoon and get off somewhere. So, it, so that's why I'm staying here because it's peaceful, whereas I need to be on my journey, <laughs> something like that. So yeah. it's really evocative, really helpful to conjure up a a landscape or a metaphor of that kind. Mm, so, yeah, the, both of those things. Uh, I think, yeah, asking for if I were a landscape now. Yeah. Would it be? Uh, it, it teaches you a lot. Yeah. That's, and then uh, even even if we just sit against a tree or lean against a tree, like there's something in the body that knows what it is to rest back to back against a tree. And um and something of, um, I mean, I loved, I loved what Francis was saying, mentioning about the sacredness of, 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 of nature. And, um, you know, even if I can't get myself to lean against a tree, I can imagine myself sitting against a tree if I'm feeling really unsteady. Like, oh, it, even just leaning here on this chair, which is made of wood, you know, there's something of the memory of the tree somehow. 
Hmm. Yeah. I, I remember going to the Cager Fields up in Mayo and that landscape there is so ancient when people centuries ago were making their lives and creating their axe trade and it's, uh, it was tangible. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm, that timeless qualities. Well, mm. I mean, I'm going off on a tangent here, but you know, doing things that our ancestors would have done, which like sitting around a fire outside, or as you say, being in a boat and putting your hands in the ocean. You know, there are things. These are things that would have gone that all of our you know lying in the desert higher looking at the stars these are things that our ancestors would have known and and i love the way that sometimes when i do those i feel like oh there's a sense of me that can connect i can connect to a sort of belonging through time in 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 these practices you know sometimes i feel that certainly as a woman in who's british it's very hard for me to connect with my indigenous roots. It feels like it's been so severed by the the shape that our culture's taken place. But doing simple things like picking stinging nettles and making soup from stinging nettles and sitting around a fire and singing with friends or leaning against a tree or, you know, these things make me feel like, oh, I can somehow touch something. I can somehow touch something through this. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I was curious whether people had the experience of being in places and being very familiar with them, uh, like a deja vu, but, uh, and they, don't, they know that they've never been there before, but there's something about that experience that, that's interesting. And I remember reading a poem once and there was a line in it about the landscape recognizing them or seeing them rather than you seeing the landscape, it's the other way around, yeah. Yes, yeah, really beautiful. In fact, I, I put this quote in, in my notes for today and I didn't think I would share it, but I quite like it. I don't know if you've come across David Abraham at all. Have you, have you heard of, he, he's written yes. two books. One is called The Spell of the Sensuous. And then a decade later, he wrote a more accessible book called Becoming Animal. And, he, in, and, and his, he's really into, um, what's it called? Merlo Morris Ponty's, what's it called? That, that thing that Mer, Mer, Ponty says. Uh, phenomenology. That's it. He's really into <laughs> phenomenology. Now, don't ask me what that is. I did once know, but it's gone out of my brain. But, but what he does is he really speaks about reciprocity in nature. So not only am I, um, not only am I taking in the mountain, the ma mountain takes in me. The mountain speaks to me just as I speak to the mountain. And it's so beautiful the way he evokes it. So beautiful. So this is the quote that I put from David Abraham. It says, I mean, it's, it's not the best quote from him, but he says, we are by now so accustomed to the cult of expertise that the very notion of honoring and paying heed to our directly felt experience of things, of insects and wooden floors, of broken down cars and bird pecked apples and the scents rising from the soil. They seem odd and somewhat misguided as a way to find out what's worth knowing. And I really loved it because, you know, so much of the, some of how I work is about coming back into the body and sensing from the body and um, how that can be just as important as academia. I'd love to just add to that. I, I went to a talk by David uh, 15 years ago, something like that, Spell of the Sensuous. It was amazing because he, he was actually a, a magician in Alice's yeah, restaurant. Yeah. So this is how he met shamans all over the world, showing them, <laughs> he'd show them a magic trick and they'd say, oh, come in and they'd share their secrets with him or whatever they chat. But um, his book, Spell of the Sensuous, and the talk is about how pre-literate pre cultures 
read landscape. Yeah. They store their stories in landscape. Uh, and we have that. So like you go to Dartmoor in England, you say, oh, look, that's, there's, the, there's the three sisters or whatever. And there's a story about that. <laughs> and uh, so the stories are embedded there. When I came out, this is what I wanted to share. When I came out, of course, he's entranced us somewhat with his talking. And I thought, there's a huge tree where you just come out of the college. And I thought, what? I, I thought, okay, so what if I tried to read you? What are you saying? And I just, wow. I just, <laughs> it opened up. I said, I will read you like I read a book. Just, what are you, what am I reading? And it just, it's like the tree. I can't explain it. I, it's like, well, I found, yeah, a connection, this deep connection in the same way that words, when you get meaning, it's a sense of connection. You, you get the meaning of something, you're connected. And I, was, I don't, I can't tell you what it said to me. <laughs> it's just a direct connection with the life of the tree. And, uh, and I was like blown away with um, the age and the grandeur of the thing. Uh. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it's worth trying that. What? read it what, what's the rock saying to me i mean even breathing with a tree is a wonderful breathing. practice mm. because mm. that whole sense of when i'm breathing out uh the tree is breathing in what i'm breathing out and what the tree breathes out i'm breathing in so mm. just on a very kind of simple level there's this exchange and i there's something i really love about that mm -hmm. Um, can I uh, can I just share something, um, Claire? Have you heard of Tim Robinson? Yes. So uh, Tim Robinson died last year of COVID. He was in his eighties, and his wife died a week before him. To cut a long story short, he's written a number of books, but he was a uh, Cambridge mathematician, but also an abstract artist. And he moved to the west coast of Ireland, to the Aran Islands. And um, he was asking for a map. Have you got a map of the islands? Uh, and they said, no. And the lady in the post office said, no, I don't. But why don't you draw one or something like that? And that set him on a totally new career as an artist. And um, he then moved to the uh, Connemara and the west coast of Ireland and mapped it all out. But it's not just about the mapping, it's more about what, um, what Philip was talking about and you were talking about. He um, would find out from all the locals the name of the fields. He would find out the name of the stories behind the fields. And um, so I think they, as far as I know now, they teach a course in English in Cambridge uh, in one of the faculties there based on landscape. Now, it probably isn't the kind of stuff we're talking about, but it could be, who knows? But for anyone who's interested in, in, in learning more about how he mapped landscapes, his name is Tim Robinson, and his company uh, is called Folding Maps. So all he left his, um, his uh, workshop and his building uh, to University College Galway as a resource. Uh, they took all his um, papers and manuscripts, and uh, it's in the library in University College Galway, but the building they gave back to the local community to build a, a center for artists and for communications and presumably for landscape as well. That's mm -hmm. just, uh, and I had the good fortune of meeting him a number of times and helping him with some of his projects. Thank you. Thank you for sharing about that. I'll definitely look him up. Yeah, wonderful. Francis. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next section, um, which is a bit <laughs> relating to when I was in prison. Um, but I wasn't actually in prison as a prisoner, uh, just not to say. <laughs> Though I could, I could have been. Um, I'm just going to turn off my light, which is buzzing in the kitchen. I'll be back in a moment. Haven't, aren't we all prisoners of our minds? <laughs> Lovely one, Francis. <laughs> We're all doing time. There's a book called We're All Doing Time. I forget. Yes. I thought you said we're all doing fine, Fiona. <laughs> doing time. Natasha, are we not all prisoners of our minds? Yeah, I mean, it depends how you uh, 
translate the word prison, doesn't it? <laughs> I like to use it loosely. Um, um, yeah, so I used to work as a Buddhist prison chaplain um, for four years. Um, and yeah, well, um, what they what they say to you before you go into prison, I don't know if anyone's been in has anyone been in prison? <laughs> yeah, okay. So we've got a couple of people that know something about prison. What they say before you go into prison is that you, they say in the training, you never know whether you can stomach the job until you're actually on the job. <laughs> so when you step in, you're like, oh no, I can't do this. And you never come back or you can kind of somehow s stomach it. Um, anyway, I found out that I could, um, at least for a period, part time, not full time. Um, yeah, so um, so I worked in um, a high security men's prison mainly because it was the prison that was nearest to where I lived. Um, and um, what I noticed, well, what I what I what became really clear to me was that um, I wanted to create a space that felt that it was welcoming to the men that came to. Um, the afternoons that I used to run and and so one thing that I used to do was call them by their first name and shake their hands which is pretty radical in prisons and um, and then the other thing that I used to invite them to do <laughs> was to share stories that gladden the heart and I think I said in my blurb that I would often get sworn at when I made this offering they'd be like well, you know, what, what planet are you on, miss? Yeah, and, um, um, but I was really, I was sort of dedicated to not, to, I was dedicated to sort of um, creating a space in which they could find ways to feel um, that there was some kind of friendliness and maybe even a place to begin to relax. So that was I was sort of dedicated to that really, and um, so I so I would always at least share a story that gladdened the heart, and um, and encourage them to see if they could find any, and I think I think so I wanted to bring this in here because like sometimes um, again like this practice of meta meta which I think I spoke about in the last. Um, workshop uh, with metta or maitri which clumsily translates as universal loving kindness i do really think that um it we can really um it can be such a resource to us to somehow find ways of opening to or leaning into or cultivating states of mind that gladden us um not as a kind of um covering over of real experience but for me it's sort of like a counterbalance <laughs> often it's a counterbalance um uh yeah so what i thought we could do is i was going to share a heart gladdening story and then i was going to encourage you to go into little breakout rooms and just share a heart gladdening story in pairs and just sort of notice what happens to you when you hear and share a heart gladdening story what happens so i like to share heart gladdening stories that are true um because it makes me feel better about being alive and i'm just trying to decide which one to share with you um so you can choose shall i share the one about a freeway accident or shall i share the one about um love well, both are about love, but in different ways. Someone decide and just tell me. The second I one. like the love one. Give okay, me the love one. we'll go for the love one. Now, this is quite, this is, you talked about, was it serendipity, Francis? This is, I don't know, something like, oh, it was like deja vu or something like that, wasn't it? Well, this, anyway, I'll tell you the story. So here we are. Um, so when I was... No, no, I start there with a the story. Okay. So I heard this story. <laughs> Hang on, I'm just trying to think about where to start with this story. Uh, no, that's where I'll start with this story. So when I was um, 20, 
I'm going to say 20, I was studying sculpture at Chelsea Art College. And um, I, I, in fact, really love photography. So I spent a lot of time in the dark room. And there was a dark room um, assistant, and we used to gab in the dark room. And uh, one day he told me he'd done an assignment at the weekend. So he used to work for editorials and take photographs. And he was telling me about this assignment that he'd done. And the assignment was he had to photograph something, and it related to this story. And this is the story. So there's a story which was that uh, um, in, in the UK there used to be something that was really badly called mental homes, yeah, and I think, um, and where people would often live that had, um, I, I really, I get really clumsy around the language of this, but basically there was this woman and she was working in a mental home. And in the mental home, there was this man and he hadn't spoken for as long as she'd been working there, which was a long time. And every day she would make time to just sit with him for about 10 minutes and read something to him, read him a poem or read him something, an article or something. And she'd been doing this for quite a long time. And one day she sat next to him and she started to read him a poem. And halfway through reading the poem, he started to recite the poem at the same time that she was reading it. And at the end of the poem, she said to him, How, what, what's happening? And he said, I, I wrote that poem. He, he was the poet. And, um, and it somehow broke something of the spell of him not speaking. Well, the story goes, <laughs> what actually happened is that they ended up marrying. This, he ended up leaving the mental home and they ended up marrying and my friend was photographing them for this article in, uh, in, an editor, in a weekend editorial. Now the second part to this story goes <laughs> that I used to teach meditation classes on Saturday at Brighton Buddhist Centre and there would often be about 75 people in the room. And one day I was sharing with them this story that gladdens the heart and someone in the room put their hand up and I said, yeah. And they said, you're talking about my grandparents. <laughs> and I was like, what? I mean, this is like probably about 18 years on. Uh, no, no, yeah, yeah, 18 years on. So um, that's my story that, that gladdens the heart that I wanted to share with you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, the power of connection, eh? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you to go into a breakout room. Maybe um, I think I could just give you five minutes. Do you think that's long enough to share a story? I think so. OK, uh, hang on a second. What's happening? Mm -mm 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 -mm. I don't know why I can't see breakout rooms. Oh, oh, there we are, breakout rooms. How many are we? So we're going to three breakout rooms. And I'll see you back here in five minutes. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for creating this space. It was nice. Yeah, was it? Great. Great. Was it really five minutes? It did feel longer. It was <laughs> five and a half minutes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm, assu I, I'm assuming, Natasha, that for obvious reasons, telling jokes don't, doesn't fall into this category. Well, do you know what? I think that humour is such a resource. Yes. It's such a resource. So, I mean, it might not fall into the category of gladdening the heart through a certain kind of story, but yeah. gladdening the heart through play, play and humour is food for the soul, okay. is my sense. Uh, yeah, really. Um, I went through a period, <laughs> one period, 
one of some periods in my life where I felt really quite dark. And um, uh, in that particular period, every morning when I got out of bed, I used to watch Asian comedy because I really love Asian comedy and there's quite a lot of it available in the UK. And, and, it, and there was something about connecting with humour and playfulness that m sort of spoke to me enough that I would kind of get up and be in the day. So I think it's got a really important um, part to play in the health of the system. Because also, in terms of laughing, we can't really laugh or play unless we're relaxed. I mean, I know that I can get really serious and that that seriousness is, is sort of a bit of too much tension. And that when I'm playing, I know there's a part of me that's relaxed enough yeah. that I can play. Well, on that subject, you, you, you'll never get as intense as the warrior Buddhist monks in Sri Lanka that I've come across. <laughs> 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 That's some sentence. <laughs> the nationalist Buddhist monks are horrendous altogether, unbelievable. <laughs> I take your word for it. I take your word for it. Okay, so we'll just move on to the last part then, which is um which I'm just gonna share again a couple of poems, short poems, and then we'll do this practice of the, the body of knowing the felt sense. Um, so the first poem is by someone called Ryokan, who um, was a Japanese um, hermit, Buddhist hermit. And um, what's quite nice about Ry Ryokan was that he loved to play. And he loved to play with the children in the neighboring village. And sometimes he would get so absorbed in playing with them that he would forget to go on his food rounds, begging for food. And so some of his poems, he speaks about it. He's a, he, he was a really... Um, beautiful um, poet and being, it seems, from his poetry. So um, this is his poem. If there is beauty, there must be ugliness. If there is right, there must be wrong. Wisdom and ignorance are complementary, and illusion and enlightenment cannot be separated. This is an old truth. Don't think it was discovered recently. I want this. I want that is nothing but foolishness. I'll tell you a secret. All things are impermanent. <laughs> so that's why I can. And then um, again, I'll read the late prayer poem and then I'll lead you into this um, practice of um, the body of knowing in the felt sense. And it's, um, it's so you need to just get comfortable for that. So um, again, late prayer. Tenderness does not choose its own uses. It goes out to everything equally. Circling rabbit and hawk. Look in the iron bucket, a single nail, a single ruby. All the heavens and hells, they rattle in the heart and make one sound. Yeah, so we can just settle down again, settling down into the pelvis and the thighs and the soles of the feet somewhere to do with our contact with the ground. Um, yeah, great. And, and we you don't have to force ourselves to settle. I think... Um, we can just allow ourselves to settle at our own pace. Yeah, so the body knows its own pace. And sometimes for me, settling involves wiggling. Yeah, it isn't always straight into being still. In fact, it isn't always anything to do with being still, but for now, we'll go with a bit of stillness. Yeah, and then we can just have a sense of maybe opening to the horizon again. Something around the face that opens. Soft eyes, we don't need to use the eyes. 
just something about the face that understands something about the horizon. Yeah, sometimes I can feel that across my cheekbones. Even across my shoulder blades. Yeah, what I love about the meditation posture is that the posture in a way becomes, the posture is the meditation. <laughs> so um, sometimes I imagine myself sitting regally. Yeah, sense, with a sense of honour, honouring, we spoke about honouring earlier. What's it like to sit regally? Taking up my space. face to the horizon, earth touching, kind of in a way it's simple. And I'm just going to invite you to bring to mind a friend. Yeah. So um, a friend that is on your side for you in your life. A friend that if they were in the space with you now, you would be happy to see them. And I'm just gonna invite you to perhaps say their name and see how the body responds. Yeah, so for me, I was recalling my friend Melissa, and I imagine I sort of immediately could feel a sense of something dropping in a good way. So you might recall a moment where you were together and you were enjoying a good time. It may be sharing food or sitting on a bench looking at the sunset or having a pint of beer. Yeah, maybe you can imagine yourselves having a good giggle. Or a warm hug. Yeah, so the body knows something of your friendship with this person. Yeah, right from the very first moment that you met. Through all of the moments that lead right up until now. Body knows something of the connection between you and your friend. In a way, we just sort of sit. We just sit really simply with this sense of our friend being close by. Yeah. And then I'm just going to invite you to um, let the sense of your friend, as it were, dissipate. and just have a wee pause. And then we're just gonna invite in a 
relatively small challenge, a kind of minor irritation, a kind of, um, what do you call it, a bit of sand in the bed kind of a challenge. So nothing gigantic here. Maybe the sound for me it might be the sound of the digger on the land today. And just see if we can just get a sense of how the body respe responds to this irritation or challenge. Do it with curiosity. We don't need to do anything about it. Just get curious what happens in the body. So the body knows something about its response. And we just see if we can breathe alongside sensing that in the body. Yeah, no need to change anything. No need to even accept it, just, uh, just noticing what happens when I bring this to mind. Maybe the sound of something. And now what we're going to do is we're going to invite into this very space, we're going to invite back our friend. So that alongside this challenge, in the same space, our friend comes in. Yeah, sits close enough for there to be a connection between you. And maybe you notice something in the body when your friend comes closer. And it's not that the challenge needs to disappear. It's like, oh, is there a way of opening up in the space, opening up to include both the friend and the challenge? Yeah. Just with a sense of curiosity. What's happening in the body? And then we can just invite a sense of both the friend and the challenge dissipating. And uh, just uh, resting. Feet on the floor, earth touching, earth, body, all that sky, all that space. Breathing, 
simple breath. Tenderness does not choose its own uses. It goes out to everything equally, circling rabbit and hawk. Look in the iron bucket, a single nail, a single ruby, all the heavens and hells. They rattle in the heart and make one sound. And we can just have a sense of gently transitioning, the soft transition from somewhere there to somewhere here, somewhere here to somewhere here. Taking your time. So that we don't rush the ending of the recording, I'm wondering if it's okay for us to go over by five or so minutes. Yeah, great. So I'm wondering if anybody has anything that they want to share or ask or share or ask. Mm. Mm. Fiona. I recognize a sort of... Uh, lots of things come in together and I same with the landscape I came up with all sorts of op op options and again with the with the friend there were options and with the challenges there were options and it took a while to sort of settle and just fix on one hmm. ah so there was something in you that was um took a bit of time to, to actually pick choose something yeah. yeah yeah I mean ideally I might have taken more time in <laughs> leading that uh, yeah so uh, thanks for sharing that yeah sometimes I mean in a way I wouldn't ask you to come up with it before because it gets a little bit um, like you kind of preempt what's going to happen but having more time mm. can be really helpful I'm not sure where, where I went to make the decision. Yeah, yeah. Who to have Yeah. But I think I, I am, lots of things come and then I just have to settle and then, then the person arrives or the landscape arrives. Mm. Mm. That's good to know. You need to settle and take your time. I know something about that. Thank you. Sorry. 
<clears throat> inviting the friend back mm. when you've got the obstacle or whatever. Mm. It's really nice learning about, ah, oh, got a completely different perspective. Suddenly there's this new perspective comes in on the problem. It's not a pro it's a problem shared or as a, a real sense of resource because she's a resourceful woman <laughs> and friend as well. But, but for someone who supports that, oh yeah, we can deal with this. It's like, whereas on my own, it's like, oh, it's my problem. I'm stuck with my problem all the way. I realized after when I brought her in, oh, that's the difference. So I have a sense of, oh, I'm, I'm with my problem. And shared, oh, it's a shared thing and it's not mine in a sense. It's just a, it's a problem to deal with, but it's not my problem. Did you get a sense? Is it this idea? Yeah. It's a separating from the thing to be done. Mm. And that's really good. <laughs> it's very liberating. Yeah. <laughs> so it's resource. Yeah, the friend is resource is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, great. That's good to hear. It sounds like there was a sense of, I don't know, that there's this sense of um, Oh yeah. There's, something comes, I don't know what that it's was. It's expanding of, it's a jumping out of a frame. Yeah, and which is a bit like, like it's just it's me. Like, oh, Phil's, um, has he, has he um, stuck himself? Or become stuck <laughs> okay I'm sure he'll come back does anyone else have anything that they want to share or ask or say as we round up it doesn't have to be nice just saying I'm getting over the nice Buddhist it doesn't have to be nice <laughs> I, I was remembering um, a, somebody who's who's just passed on and um, mm. he, he had and interesting it was kind of all happening at the same time I was just finishing up I was gesturing and I was just gestured to center and he had told us as a tennis coach to always bring our hands back oh. to the center with the tennis racket and I was thinking of another friend and this came in as I was just gesturing. So I found that very interesting. <laughs> mm, that is interesting. Yeah, it was lovely. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Claire. Okay, my dears, I'm going to stop recording then and we can have a really informal conversation. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Hang on, where is it? Stop.